Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the panel, uh, Present Dystopia, Imagining a Landscape of the Future on That of the Present. My name is Edgar Peterser. I'm based at the African Center for Cities at the University of Cape Town, and am uh, a long-standing addict of the book lounge, um, <laughs> and my bank balance definitely reflects that. So it's an enormous pleasure to be able to uh, chair this panel this afternoon. And um, I've got the privilege to be in the company of three incredibly accomplished and really talented writers. Um, allow me to introduce firstly, uh, Kelly Eve Kupman, who is a multidisciplinary artist with interests in many mediums, which include prose, film, and theater. She's also one of the co-creators of the online sensation, Colored Mentality, and if you haven't seen it yet, what is your mentality? And is a co-director of FEM Projects, <laughs> a feminist organization committed to sexual and reproductive health and rights education in schools. And together with Kim Windvogel, she compiled They Called Me Queer, and her memoir, Because I Couldn't Kill You, was published in 2019. Most recently, and the topic of today, she co-edited with Sarah Summers, Our Move Next. And it's available for free download yes. on which site? Um, it's www.backyardpitch.co.za, but there are like posters and stickers everywhere, including Great. the lift that you can scan yeah. it in. On exactly, and you can learn more at the official launch of the publication this evening yes. at five o'clock. Yes. And secondly, we've got Alistair McKay, and he is a South African writer who's interested in exploring queerness, marginalization, social justice, and climate change. Um, he holds an MFA in creative writing from Columbia University and an MA in politics from Edinburgh University. And for many years, he's worked as, in a marketing strategy consultancy and survived exactly one year in political communications. <laughs> and hopefully we'll hear a little bit more uh, about that uh, endurance. His short fiction has been published in various outlets, including Brittle Paper, New Contrast, and others. As, and as well as an antho uh, in the anthologies Queer Africa 2, The Other, and Queer Africa Selected Stories. And he's just published his debut novel that we're discussing today, It Doesn't Have to Be This Way. And then finally, Keely Schoeners is a writer from Fox Lake, Illinois. Currently, they live and work in Cape Town. The essays have appeared in the journals James Baldwin Review and Safundi, as well as the publications Artrop, Africana, Asai, Mask, and full stop. They are the editor of Artrop, founder and editor of In Review, and co-founder of Best Friend Club. Their debut novel, How to Build a Home for the End of the World, has just been published and rolled off the press a few days ago, and you can purchase copies downstairs <laughs> as well. Now, I'm an urbanist. Um, that is just a fancy way of saying I don't know what my disciplinary basis is, but I'm <laughs> obsessed with cities and with futures. So in my discipline and in my tradition, which is sort of at the intersection of design and planning, we try to imagine or that is riddled with a conceit that we can both imagine, anticipate, and plan for alternative futures. And then we can calibrate a whole set of policy architectures to get us to move in the direction of that future. The tradition is inherently optimistic about the future, um, and to be honest, naively so, because what we know from extensive critique and bitter experience is that this optimism often is complicit with exploitative power dynamics. Now, as someone who comes from that tradition, I've always had a fascination with speculative fiction, in part because in the literary and artistic invocations of the future, it always seems to be raining. It's always dark, it's dystopian, it's bleak, and often violent. And as a consequence, it, the only spaces for transcendence that exist in those futures are in relationships, right? In interior landscapes, in how we inhabit natural systems despite the odds, and again, in all three of these works, in spiritual domains. And there's always this exploration of and yearning for what one could call psychic enclaves, that can propel resistance and survival, despite often overwhelming evil or dread and so forth. So I think it's fair to say that all three of these novels are squarely in that tradition. And for me, 
I can't but be, if I guess, both deeply intrigued, um, but also curious about what goes into this craft, uh, what goes into the disposition uh, to bring these incredible books into the world. Now, to say one or two words about each of the works. So, um, our move next, the anthology that will be launched today, is an absolutely brilliant collection of fresh and brave voices from many different geographies on the continent. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, the ages are not in the bios in the book, but from how the authors speak about themselves, they seem to be fairly young. Um, and there is this incredible energy and freshness in the work. Um, the second book um, by Alistair, It Doesn't Have to Be This Way, is, I found the book incredibly sensitive, finely calibrated to the inner worlds of the main characters, but it's also profoundly imaginative and unnerving because it's set in Cape Town. It, it, it recasts our future in, in, in incredible, incredibly vivid detail. Uh, the book is beautiful, it's brave, and I found it really, really challenging, to be honest. And then finally, um, How to Build a Home for the End of the World is, um, I found it really affecting. There were, there's moments in this novel where you kind of, you know, when a novel blows your hair back and you kind of have to read the paragraph again because it's so poignant and so beautiful and so moving. Um, but this is almost an offset because um, the novel is tough. It, 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 it speaks with uh, um, a, a visceral quality about both the incredible hurt we can exact on each other, but also the incredible capacity for generosity and for love. Um, and it's woven in this fantastical land, post-apocalyptic landscape uh, in the US as our characters make a road trip. So these are really treasured gifts and they're absolute bargains. Uh, in terms of what you will get out of them. So do go and buy uh, copies downstairs. So enough from me. I guess because, you know, all of these, both the novels and the anthology and, and, and even the short stories in the anthology are so dense and packed. Um, you know, they all intricately woven. They conjure incredibly dense worlds of the future. Uh, and so I imagine, and I think you will correct me, but I would have assumed they would have taken a very long time to gestate. And um, maybe you can draw us into these books um, before we discuss some specific themes by giving us a little bit of the origin story. Why did you bring this into the world? And why did it have to come out of your bosom, if you will? <laughs> so maybe we can start with you. Sure. Um, firstly, I love everything you just said about speculative fiction and justice. It, like, yeah, amazing. Um, so why is exactly in response to how you started this panel is that I think often, like, versions of the future that are so dystopic and so, like, mired in um, capitalism and technological advancement are very much because the genre has been, like, propagated by white male global north voices. Like, someone like Octavia Butler has recently had a resurgence in the world after you know, being dead. And if you look at her work, it has a completely different cosmology. And while um, I wouldn't say that it's like globally hopeful, um, it definitely deals with the same kinds of themes and realities in very different ways. So for me, I think like the more that a lot of dystopian or speculative fiction work in the, the canon or the trajectory imagines the end of capitalism as the end of the world. Mm -hmm. um, resource scarcity as like a core ideology, but that's not the like lived truth for people that live on the continent or necessarily in the diaspora. Like there's a different ideology and there's also a different cosmology. That's why spirituality and ancestry and lots of different relations to the ecology and environment are rife in work that comes from uh, black and indigenous voices and voices on the continent. So for us, uh, being inspired by uh, artists working in speculative fiction that aren't white male and from America, it was, Sure. cool and important to think about an anthology that was public that people from anywhere in the continent could contribute to and not necessarily only people who identified as like writers in a very formal way yeah, uh, yeah. So, so i'm really struck by that answer in part because you know when i read some of those white men you're talking about um they often conjure worlds of scarcity that is actually the norm already for most sure. of the continent, right? Mm. So in that sense, the future is already prevalent. And 
um, really foregrounding stories that can speak in a more visceral and direct experiential way about those supposed futures makes seems to be a, a, an incredibly important and valid project. So yeah, uh, just to say that I can, I can see the potential of that. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Alistair, why don't you tell um, us about so how I guess came into Like that. you, Edgar, I think I was once naive and optimistic and hopeful about the future. Um, I think the last few, few years have been quite rough on millennials. <laughs> mm -hmm. Sort of growing up in the era of like Mandela and the first Mbeki presidency, I thought we'd put all, all of our troubles behind us and that the future was hopeful and, and, and you know, we'd sorted everything out. Uh, and we've just been hit you know, with recessions and plagues. And um, I had the experience to, to study overseas and twice actually, and both times I, I returned back to South Africa, I was struck by what you've said, by how dystopian the lives of so many people in, in South Africa are, hmm. and that we, this, this reality that we just accept as normal is so abnormal, hmm. um, and, and the lived experiences of so many people is, is so dystopian already. So that was, that was sort of ticking along in the back of my hmm. head uh, and sort of percolating. As you say, it's been many years that I've been thinking about this. Um, from, the, from the climate point of view, I've, I've just always really loved nature. Um, I'm quite an anxious person, and I often find like just being in, in a forest or being, you know, in a park, maybe because I grew up in Joburg, we don't get a lot of nature. It, it, it was really special to me. And I, I studied politics for my undergrad, and I remember doing a semester on green political thought and green political thinking, mm -hmm. and seeing all these predictions of what would happen if, if the economy didn't change, you know, mm -hmm. and, you know, peak oil, the theory yeah. of peak oil, and climate collapse and all of that. And I just couldn't understand that this wasn't front page news every day all yeah. around the world. It was yes. kind of seen as this niche interest. Um, and I guess over the years, I just thought about it more and more. And we saw the rise of the right wing um, in America with Trump. And we see Brexit. Um, and I just started to think about how all of these things are interconnected. Yeah. You know? yeah. Um, yeah. It's, been a, it's been a long process. I guess that's how it's... it's yeah, been so, I mean, so I guess you, though, had a choice to reflect on those interconnections through your political science mm. uh, sort of discipline. Um, why did you feel the need to express it through, through fiction, through, through your writing? I think when I try and write nonfiction, I get really angry. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I rant a lot. And I think that can maybe put people off. So okay. that was actually the biggest challenge for me in writing this novel, was trying to like, not turn it down, because I think, I, think, uh, I think my views come through quite strongly in this book. Yeah. But I, I, I did try and then focus on the characters and what it's like to experience these lives that these characters are yeah. living, and yeah. sort of slow down and let them speak yeah. for themselves. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because I think I think fiction lets you engage with things in a in a maybe more emotional, maybe yeah. not more emotional, but like, yeah, in a more balanced way yeah. than than yeah, yeah. than like yeah. diatribes. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. <laughs> so in January of 2017, I took a road trip with my father from our small town, Fox Lake, Illinois, to Los Angeles, California, where I was doing my undergrad at the time. And as we were on this journey, I had this idea that you could probably write a very realistic novel about a father and a daughter on a road trip through America and say that it was happening at the end of the world and nobody would bat an eye because I think, I think a lot of our world is dystopian. Um, America, I certainly see as a dystopian place, a place with a history that was completely decimated by mm. colonialism, um, the genocide of indigenous peoples, and our history of slavery as well. And what is that if not mm. an apocalyptic scenario? Mm -hmm. And Americans kind of grow up maybe subconsciously uh, knowing that they are living in a post-apocalyptic scenario. So that was the ori original idea of the book. Um, I was only 20 years old at the time, so I had no idea what I was doing, but I started the book. And um, because I lived in California at the time, the crisis that was the most prevalent in Los Angeles in 2017 was a major drought. Yeah. Um, so I decided that the end of the world in my book would be a water crisis. And then interestingly, I came to Cape Town to study my master's in creative writing, and then there was another major water crisis yeah. in 20. So we can blame you. It follows you around. <laughs> okay. I hope Good it's. To know. I hope it's not my fault. <laughs> but you know, I was interested in this idea of like, you know, if you think about the world as kind of this 
stack of pebbles and you take one pebble away and if the pebble is water, mm -hmm. then everything comes tumbling down. Yeah. And what does that mosaic now look mm -hmm. like? Mm -hmm. That was kind of one of the guiding questions for mm -hmm. the novel. Mm -hmm. But the, yeah, okay, thanks. Uh, that's, that's really helpful. So you all seem comfortable with this notion of dystopia. Um, <laughs> so I'd love to hear your thoughts a little bit about this coupling of dystopia, utopia, right? Um, because, I mean, just from what, you, from what you've just said is, you know, we, we have to acknowledge and accept that we're already in a dystopic mm -hmm. environment and context and so on. So is there something about that binary, that coupling, that we should think differently about? Or, yeah, uh, what's, your, what's your thoughts on this idea of dystopia? Oh, can I go? Uh, we can go any <laughs> sequence, so, but, but I think, uh, Kelly, if you on. On, I'm on this side. On the edge <laughs> or so of saying something. So, uh, no, I, I don't necessarily subscribe to the, the framework or the binary of dystopia and utopia. I think both are equally unattainable with like heaven being the idea of utopia that has caused a lot of really bad structural, cultural conditioning. Mm -hmm. And I suppose something that look like, looks like Mad Max being at the other end of the spectrum, which also like upholds a certain system of values and ideologies. And I don't, I think, if we think about uh, speculation and visionary fiction as like a tool in our in the ability to radically imagine and have like new stories uh, promote new possibilities and therefore inform new actions, utopia or dystopia doesn't necessarily become the most useful framework because mm -hmm. both are somewhat improbable or have right. ingredients that uh, are not um, are not possibilities that we would like to choose from from the the myriad of possibilities that we have to work with now. So uh, I mean, e extraction and resource scarcity is one framework, but resources aren't scarce. Even mm -hmm. though climate change is happening, they are extracted by a capitalist system that benefits a certain percentage of the world. You know, like above and beyond that, there are so many possibilities that we can actively speculate on, and I think. For me, uh, speculative fiction or vis visionary fiction or thinking about things as building up new mythos or uh, new kind of folklore is, uh, for me, gives me more hope in an active sense um, and make, helps me to think through the current, car our current challenges looking at like the vast historical trajectory of possibilities we have mm -hmm. for resistance and existence and the ones that we can create moving forward coming out of a crisis like COVID, where we didn't have the tools to think, but where it became very clear that we all need room to yeah. imagine. And it's yeah. hard to imagine when you feel completely hopeless. Yeah. Um, it's, it's not like the, the best position to, to move from. Mm -hmm. And I think for many peoples, like if we look at our own country's history, slavery, apartheid, colonization, it's always been some version of the end of the world. You know, like yeah. Yeah, <laughs> many cultures and lives and ways of being have ended. Um, and so there's something, I think, restorative in being, uh, in, 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 in being grounded in thinking about how we view alternatives yeah. with the obvious structural pressures of the now. Okay. So, 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 so for you, sort of fostering imaginative capacity, that's, yeah. that's, that's really the, the, the key priority or, yeah. or the, the, a useful frame. So I want to sort of because, Alistair, your novel kind of goes into the technological realm uh, qu quite a bit with, with, incredible, with incredibly sort of specific rendering and so on, uh, screens and stuff on the eyes and all kinds of uh, experiences. And to pick up on your theme, I mean, I'm interested in this tension between building a capacity to, to kind of be rooted in history and to understand the long durée of why we're in the mess we're in, um, but also being able to see the possibility of qualitatively different mm. worlds mm. that were simply not afforded us 100 mm. years ago because the technological possibilities didn't exist, right? So, so I'm not so interested in, uh, in, in, in sort of technology as the answer or the solution, but I am interested in the material base of our societies are changing because of new technologies, right? So there are kind of all kinds of things possible now that couldn't have been imagined before. So is there a way, and because you do go there, unless I'm gonna ask you this, <laughs> is there a way to connect um, what Khalif was saying 
about imaginative capacity, but also being, if you will, open-minded about technology? Where do you come down on that? What's your views on that? Uh, I, th I think definitely. So for me, there is a lot of technology in my book, especially towards the later part of the book, because it, it follows sort of from the present into, into the future. But I didn't want to glorify technology or, or, or have like cool innovations for mm -hmm. the sake of like dazzling readers. I, I very much mm -hmm. wanted to show that it's... So, so just for the audience, <laughs> so he's got this, one of his uh, <laughs> technologies are uh, a minibus taxi as we know it, but it's a pod that floats. I so <laughs> want to get in that pod, but anyway, go, go on. <laughs> um, but yeah, I sort of, I wanted to, I wanted to look more actually at, at the assumption that technology is going to save us or can right. save us, you know? And I wanted mm. to maybe subvert that idea because mm. I think so many people these days, especially the ultra wealthy in like the US with Elon Musk and, and all of that, wanting to send rockets into space and it, and it sort of ties into a whole, I guess, quite colonial um, science fiction tradition mm. of colonizing other planets oh. and like not dealing with our problems at home. So I, I wanted to maybe look at the more sinister side of technology and mm -hmm. it, it is becoming more and more pervasive in our lives um, and harder to mm. avoid. Uh, we're more distracted by our, well, by our phones, for example. Um, you know, they have psychologists working at, at the social media companies making these things more addictive, harder to look away. Um, so for me, I, 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 yeah, it's, it's, not, it's neither, it's neither mm. a dystopia mm. or a utopia from that mm. point of view. It's, it's, it's mm. a complicating factor and it is changing yeah. society, yeah. but I don't think it's necessarily yeah. improving things. Uh, well, in some ways it's improving things, but I think the assumption that it's, it's the answer to everything is, mm. is something I wanted to, to question. Um, I guess for me, the novel is sort of dystopian in terms of I was trying to frighten the readers a little mm. bit. I was kind of trying it to... Worked. Say, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it worked. Okay. That's it. I was sort of trying to say, like, this is the path we're on. Do you like where it ends up? Um, but within that, there are sort of, there are imagined alternatives. Um, what like Kelly was saying, but there's also that Ursula Le Guin quote that I love, where she says, basically, it's a writer's duty to, to imagine alternatives mm -hmm. to, to the path that we're on, to try and, so that people don't feel hopeless and apathetic, um, and they can maybe work towards something. So two of the characters in my novel actually uh, become sort of obsessed with creating these alternative futures uh, through a virtual reality campaign. Mm -hmm. You know, somewhere there's like a, where we don't destroy the planet ecologically, somewhere there's like a wealth cap and more redistributive um, yeah. economy, that kind of thing. And they build these virtual worlds for people to experience so that we don't realize, so that they do realize that the path we're on is not inevitable. You know, yeah. we still have some sort of agency to change yeah. that. Yeah. I'm very curious what your answer is to this. <laughs> so, um, different from Alistair's book, there's very little technology in my book. There's no cell phones, there's no flying yeah. cars, yeah. there's barely any cars. <laughs> um, and the reason for doing that is because, kind of like Alistair, I think that the Jeff Bezos and the Elon Musks of the world assume that uh, technology is going to innovate in an almost organic way mm -hmm. to fix mm -hmm. what is broken mm -hmm. about our past. Yeah. Um, and that's a very capitalist notion that uh, innovation is always going to fix what was broken before mm -hmm. and because there's innovation there will never be an end to capitalism. Mm -hmm. um, but I think we kind of know intuitively how although these technologies have made our lives much more comfortable um, and more convenient in many ways, they're also quite dehumanizing. Mm -hmm. um, and I personally feel like, you know, when shit hits the fan, and scientists are saying that shit is hit definitely hitting the fan, um, that, that our cell phones and the corporations and the politicians of the world aren't gonna be the people to care for us. Mm -hmm. I think we know implicitly that the people who are going to be there to care for us are our family, our friends, our close-knit communities. And when I think about a hopeful future, I think less about what is going to be innovated and more about what needs to be unraveled. Yeah. Uh, so the trajectory of my book is definitely uh, one of unraveling, yeah. trying to get to what is essential, which is how do we care about each other? Yeah, mm. yeah, yeah. Mm. No, thanks. That's um, that's a wonderfully sort of um, evocative way to to ground us, I guess. And um, 
But I, uh, Kelly, I want to come back to you and, and, and this anthology that you've put together. So as I've intimated before, it, it was, I was struck by the sort of youthful vibrancy of, of a lot of the, the stories and the art in the anthology and so on. And so one is I think it is absolutely fantastic that you're creating a platform for more voices and a more diverse set of perspectives to come into, into the frame. Um, but that also comes with a responsibility, right, mm -hmm. as an editor about mm -hmm. which voices do you foreground and so on. And, 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 and so can you share with us a little bit what went into that curation? Um, oh, sure. What was published, what wasn't included, why? and how that speaks to our, you know, sort of the broader ambition of the anthology. Sure, sure. So I, I didn't curate the book alone. I worked with my creative partner, Sarah Summers, and uh, a team, including our, our copy editor, who is Kelly Smith. Um, and we put out a public call, as public as, you know, digital and the platforms that we know of could go over the duration of the months that we put out the call. Um, and the idea was to try and get submissions from... Uh, across the continent, like as many places as possible. Um, we got from a certain social geographic pool, but not from everywhere. And the provocation for the book was broadly speaking towards activists in, in a way that was framed as anyone who would identify as such. So healers or cultural practitioners or, you know, anyone who uh, em embodies this, this kind of care work, you know, which can manifest in, in different ways. So. We wanted to invite people who hadn't published before or didn't necessarily think of themselves as only fiction writers to submit. Um, and that was the first base. And then in the curation process, we looked for uh, inclusion and intersectionality of voices. Um, we looked for the social geographies. We looked for um, as many different kinds of perspectives on speculation. The invitation was also speculative fiction, yeah. which we've now reframed to use the term digital folklore, because that's what the book feels like. Um, and so we like, and speculative fiction can include things like surrealism. You know, it's not necessarily only sci-fi, which is what yeah. people immediately think about yeah. with speculative fiction. And it can include poetry. Like, it, there's so many. It can, and there's a, a scientist, a biologist that wrote about what the future uh, looks like if we become more like plants, because yeah. plants are gonna survive, like, <laughs> in some form or the other. So it was looking at. As, as wide a range yeah. as possible of, of, of ways of interpreting that, oh. that provocation. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and it does it, you know, extremely well. I found when I was working my way through it, I had to pause, you know, because it, there was, it was, the perspectives were so different, mm -hmm. and I kind of just had to allow each of the stories or the artistic interventions to sink in and, and kind of work its, whatever it was doing, you know, sort of to my psyche. Um, so I think, you know, that, that worked really well, the, the, the sort of different perspectives and voices was really striking uh, in the anthology. Okay. Um, but I want to pick up on this idea of activism, right, mm -hmm. because I think it is a common theme. Mm -hmm. And in a way, um, the community that clarifies itself at the end of your novel mm -hmm. um, sounds very much like the community she's invoking, mm -hmm. right, mm -hmm. in terms of this community of care, um, uh, sort of uh, returning things to a kind of an essence mm. um, of solidarity in some form. Mm. Um, can you say a little bit about that? Because what, what was striking about the book is that in that initial, you know, we get a glimpse of that alternative form of family care, mm. if you will. Mm. Um, and then there's this incredibly difficult daughter-father relationship that <laughs> that, that it kind of encounters also all these absolutely crazy folk along the way. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's this, you know, sort of ending of it. Um, yeah, so, so tell the audience a little bit about that and, sure. and why that was where you arrived at and why that's a form of activism. Sure. So um, initially, I had this idea that instead of um, kind of the fascists and the corporations being in charge, at the end of the world, because I was tired of fascists and corporations, mm -hmm. um, I initially thought I'm going to have the people who are in charge of the limited water and the limited resources be kind of like activist NGO types mm -hmm. almost. And when I created them initially, they're called the collective in the book. I genuinely thought that they were going to handle things. <laughs> and surprisingly to me, they 
became almost more interested in their own sustainability mm -hmm. than in actually caring for the communities that they were meant to serve. Um, and I thought, okay, that's interesting. Now I need kind of a dialectic to okay, respond so to them. Okay, so that was a surprise to you as well. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. yeah. And, and that was very much like a, a grassroots um, community-based yeah. uh, familial ties. Yeah. Um, kind of banding together haphazardly and certainly not without um, complication, mm -hmm. um, but, but responding to the, the organization which was more interested in protecting itself. Yeah. Um, and then I think the other thing you were mentioning about the father-daughter relationship is the fact that I also noticed that the end of the world put a lot of strain on the nuclear family mm -hmm. and almost kind of forced people to make new families out of, um, yeah, happenstance, yeah. different ties. Um, yeah, it starts off with a like white ordinary family in Fox Lake, Illinois, a mother, a father, two children, a grandmother, and sorry, spoilers, but at the end it's like um, the father and the daughter and then a bunch of activists and living in the house of this academic who's given up anthropology and is going to become an activist with them even though she's 76 years old. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so there's something about the, 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 the sort of exploration and the discovery of new kinds of family and new kinds of love um, that echoed very strongly, Alistair, with the incredible sort of set of relationships that you draw between your main characters and, um, and this tragedy of Viwe, right? I mean, in terms of his, um, his cultural incapacity to embrace his queerness, um, but then finding love and then in a way betraying that or it gets betrayed, whatever way one wants to read that. Um, but there's also an interlacing of that with, uh, with, with, with activism, right? And, and the tensions that that sort of puts the relationships, uh, sort of the strain that it creates in the relationships and the mm. senses of betrayal and so forth. Yeah. Um, I mean, ex t tell us a little bit more about those intimacies that you draw in the book and, uh, the, and, and kind of why is it when people take a, p a stand politically, it creates yeah. friction. It, it, it damages relationships yeah. as well, yeah. right? It's not necessarily a basis of solidarity mm -hmm. or, mm -hmm. or, 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 or attraction. Mm -hmm. So yeah, can you tell us a little bit more about that? Because it's very, very convincingly drawn. Okay. Yeah. Well, yeah. thank you. <laughs> uh, it's, um, I guess the characters in my novel are maybe uh, further behind in their journey than, than in yours. They're, they're not seasoned activists at all. Um, they sort of come to activism at various points in the book. And I think they feel quite, disempowered and quite uh, isolated uh, to start off with. And they sort of start to, find, start to find their voices and start to think, okay, we need to, we're not powerless, we can do something about this. Uh, and the relationship that you're referring to um, between Lutando and Viwe, um, I guess Lutando becomes an activist before his partner is ready for it. Mm -hmm. And it makes him more out there in the world and more, and more loud and more uh, determined and it, it just pushes some of Viewer's buttons around uh, his own self-worth issues. The, the, queer, the queer journey uh, that you touch on is, is very central to his story. Um, and it's a, it's a journey of learning to sort of accept yourself and love yourself, which becomes in this world increasingly difficult because not only yeah. has he grown up in a culture which tells him that that's not okay, but the city becomes full of these sort of movements that believe these are the end times. Um, and I was interested in what those kinds of movements would feel about queer people and women mm. Mm. Um, and people who've traditionally been sort of seen as alien or other. Um, so yeah, there's, there's a, there's a, there's a, there is a tension, as you say, between their love for each other and wanting to be there for each other and support each other, but one not really feeling ready for the struggles that the other one feels are very important. Um, yeah, I won't, I won't give but, away but that. I mean, the, but I yeah, mean, so, sorry, no, spoiler alert, I guess, <laughs> but with Vuyo, falls into a different kinds of activism, mm. right? Because, you know, we don't have to associate, and I think it comes through in all of the, the books, as activism isn't in and of itself a progressive thing. Mm. People, mm. Exactly. you know, fall into activism for all okay. kinds of reasons yeah. and supports all kinds of 
mm. um, uh, uh, sort of uh, conservative agendas mm. as mm. well. Mm. And again, in your book, I mean, uh, damn, they scary, <laughs> right? Uh, so, so these uh, millennial, uh, millennial uh, sort of end of times religious yes. cult type movements mm. um, that we falls into, I, I guess. Um, yeah, so, so I mean, just that, that it's a double-edged sword, right? There are m multiple forms of activism. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. He sort of goes down quite a dark path, yeah. right? And, yeah. and it, is, it is a form of activism. I don't yeah. think I'd really thought of it like that, but it, yeah. but it, but it is. Yeah. 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 I scared myself writing those passages yeah. as well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but it, it kind of comes to this final point, and then I'll give the audience an opportunity to, to, to climb into the conversation. But is this this sort of redemptive idea of spirituality, right? But a spirituality mm -hmm. connected with nature. So that's also something that is, I mean, I was, it was so striking as a common theme across the three books. Uh, so obviously the organizers of the event know what they're doing. And they put <laughs> these panels together. But um, the, yeah, so there's something both in response to technology, I guess, but also the sense of what are reference points to deal with the intensity of all of the multiple crises, mm. climate, financial, mm. social, political, you know, it's like all stacking together at the same time. And if you happen to be at the butt end of the world in Africa, all of those things are exaggerated, of mm. course. You know, it's even more intense mm. and extreme. Um, and then there's this sort of redemptive potential of reconnecting with people in relationships that are uh, non-heteronormative, but that also has a basis in an appreciation of nature mm -hmm. and, some, and, and the sort of restorative quality of that, right? Mm -hmm. um, that comes through in quite a few of the contributions mm -hmm. to the anthology. I'm curious, what, why do you think that's the case? Mm, just quickly, I, thematically, every, almost all submissions, even ones that were not put into the anthology, had a lot of like narratives or textures or thematics around ancestry, around spiritual cosmologies, and not always in a redemptive way. Yeah. Like there was a lot of pain in a lot yeah. of the stories. The ancestors were fucking angry, you yeah. know, and like yeah. coming to be like, "What are you doing?" Yeah. But it was it it really struck us as well. Like whenever we speak, it was consistent. And I mean. I first wondered if it definitely speaks to this being an African anthology and our sp perspectives and cosmologies being different mm. to what, th to that being uh, an Im like spirituality, ancestry, our, our histories and the way we embody them being so integral to who we are now and how we conceive of the future. Mm. Um, and so, um, and so absent in a technological yeah. kind of versions of it that was really interesting. And also just the urgency of, I suppose, like healing, yeah. intergenerational healing, familial, familial healing. And without that, there, is, there being no future or, or none worth uh, living in. And it's not, it was not an idea. I don't like it was so pervasive yeah. that it was uh, an, an embodied reality, a yeah. thing that lots of people were thinking and mm. feeling, you yeah. know, and trying to yeah. find like a lexicon yeah. for. Yeah, 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 no, absolutely. Uh, mm. So yeah. I, I grew up Catholic, so I'm very attracted to the, the redemption <laughs> arc. Um, and almost writing this book, I was, I was finding uh, the temptation to make up my characters into heroes mm. and um, to make them prove something and to reward them in the end. Mm. Um, so what I tried to do instead was, instead of making them prove themselves onwards, I tried to make them go inwards and, and try to tell the truth about themselves to themselves yeah. and then approach caring for other people with the same kind of honesty. Um, that it's was interesting. Yeah, the, yeah, that yeah. was the redemption that that I saw in the end. So, so, so just sorry. This is a very, very pedantic technical, <laughs> but I can't help it now because it was a question I had reading the book. So when you when so when the dad loses his memory, yes, is that because he can't do yes. that journey completely? Okay. Yes. Okay. okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> sorry, I just. Uh, uh, yeah, I think spirituality in my book is is also a double-edged sword. So there's a way in which people turn to the more uh, conservative traditional religions to try and make sense of what's happening all around them. And I think 
things do feel like they're coming to a head in, yeah. in our culture, in the world, and I think that's leading to a lot of uncertainty, and people don't like uncertainty, so they, they turn to more traditional religions, uh, and that has all the negative consequences we were talking about a second ago. But I think there is also a return for some of these characters, the sort of the scales falling from their eyes, to use a religious yeah. reference, uh, <laughs> in terms of like technology that they've been obsessed with or losing, mm -hmm. losing themselves in, in these virtual worlds, and they start to realize throughout the book more and more how much they need each other and how much the only thing that really matters in all of this um, are, are each other, the, the friendships and, the, and their love for each other. Um, so I think there, there is some sort of redemption in that and in, and in nature, absolutely. Yeah. Like, um, yeah. I, I'm trying to show how barren the world is without the wildernesses, you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. And Milo, the, the little boy that starts and end the, mm. ends the novel, uh, yeah, he, his, people have actually asked me before if the, if the ending is magical realism because there's a lot of nature as spirituality coming through, mm. but I think that's just, you know, hopefully some sort of interconnectedness yeah. again with our ancestral past, mm. with uh, the traditions of, with the continent and with, with the nature around us. Thank you. So I've got, as you know, a lot more questions, but I'm, uh, we're running short on time, so I'm going to face the audience. So the procedure is we get one question at a time, we ask our panelists to respond, and uh, we continue with that until uh, we are booted out of the space. So who wants to go first? And you, you don't have to have read the book, you can just pick up on the feed. Anyone? No? So, yeah, we're good. Okay, so we'll just continue to talk. Is that fine? Okay. This oh. question. Oh, oh, wait. question. Oh, sorry, please. <laughs> so I'm, I'm looking forward to reading all of your books, and thank you for introducing us to these wonderful authors and editors. Um, I was wondering, Kelly, for the collections that you had, how would you think of it as um, similar to, but distinct from the collections? And I'm sorry, I can't remember the editor's name that did Octavia's Brood. Oh, it's Adrian Marie Brown. Um, it's, it's her work. Uh, it's such an interesting question. It was very, ins I'm a huge Adrian Marie Brown and Walidi Amarisha fan. They're, they're, the, there's a phrase in the foreword that they use in the book that says, um, all organizing is science fiction because the ability to live under oppression and think about a new world is key to resistance. But it was inspired by her work in that book because Octave is Brewed, just for context, is an American anthology curated and created by mostly uh, black and brown American organizers. And so it was a huge, huge, huge influence for us. In fact, a Triangle Project bought us copies after they saw us put out the call. And it, yeah, it's, it's wonderful to think about her work and think about links here. So thank you for asking that. Thank you. Anyone else, please? Thanks so much. Um, I'm looking forward to reading um, all of the books. Uh, I have read Alice's already, um, and I really loved it. Um, um, my question is actually um, uh, more about how all of your versions of the end of the world or dystopias seem to not be about like a specific moment or thing that happens, um, but more like like uh, like that saying you don't you don't go out with a sh with a bang but with a whimper. Um, and I wondered if you guys could just speak about that and like how you guys got to that and, and, and where that thinking goes. Great. Sheila, why don't I can, you start? I can yeah. start. Um, so I thought about the same um, quote uh, for my book. I was thinking not a bang and not a whimper, but a cold shoulder. Um, so I kind of wanted this water crisis not, I don't refer to it as like um, we've exhausted all of the water. I say that um, there's kind of like a worldwide drought, which is logically improbable. But I kind of wanted to give water agency. I wanted the earth to kind of respond to human beings um, abusing it. Um, so in a lot of ways, um, the end of the world is kind of the land responding to to being fracked, to being exploited. Um, there's a line towards the end of the book where there's, a, there's both a riot and a fire happening, and you don't know if it's 
uh, the fire being started organically or if it's the riot. And the line is, um, the people responding to the pain of the land and the land responding to the pain of the people. Um, so I kind of thought about the end of the world as those two um, dual, dueling natures and not just an anthropocentric, like, humans messed it up. Mm. Uh, mm. I wanted the earth to say something. Mm. Uh, absolutely. For, for me as well, the climate change is so central to, to the book. And, and climate change is not one event. It's not one cataclysmic event. It's kind of things getting more unstable and more uh, unpredictable every year. And we're already starting to see this with the day zero drought, with the wildfires in California. Um, so it's already happening. And I wanted to give that sense of it's just going to happen more and more frequently and more and more scarily until, uh, until we, at what point we realize, oh, shit, yeah. <laughs> you know, we're in this now. So, yeah. 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 <laughs> Maybe oh, I'm good. No, I, I yeah, resonate, and yeah, I think right. that <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Uh, and, and just to say uh, for the audience that in Alistair's book, the, uh, it transforms Cape Town. So basically, with sea level rise, uh, the sea is back to the castle. Most of the flat is underwater. Um, all of you my great up Signal Hill into a citadel um, <laughs> where you live in a climate-controlled environment uh, in digitally mediated <laughs> world, and the vast majority of the city's population uh, are in shacks uh, up the mountain and in between the buildings above the waterline. Um, and, yeah, so it, it's, a, it's, a, it's an incredibly vivid and disturbing uh, imagination of what Cape Town will be like in the near future. And maybe as the audience, if we don't have another question, I was curious about your, about temporality in, in your books, right? So, um, so yours, you imagine this, you know, sort of um, the impact of climate change in that dramatic way in the very, very near future. Mm -hmm. And I was curious why you made that choice. And there's a different temporality at work in, in your book. And because you're both dealing with climate uh, induced events uh, and dynamics. Yeah, I, I was curious about that. And of course, the temporality question in, in the anthology is, as you said before, very much that the, the, the past is in the present mm -hmm. and that alternative futures is only available through uh, uh, an, a sort of fostering a vocabulary or an understanding that you've got to travel via the past mm -hmm. to the future, right? Mm -hmm. so, so there's very interesting different ways in which time is worked with in, in the different works. So yeah, maybe. But Alice, did you want to go first? So I guess for me, it, it's climate change is often something that, that politicians and leaders just kick down the line. And they, they frame it as this thing which is going to take so long. It's such a slow process. We kind of don't need to worry about it now. And you see all these goals and like COP26 or whatever. You know, they're all like 2050 or 2100. Yeah. Um, and I think that, that that kind of obscures the fact that we're already starting to feel mm. uh, the effects of climate change. And I think things could get quite ugly quite a lot faster mm. than mm. Uh, a lot of people realize. So I did want to bring it forward. Yeah. It's maybe, maybe an exaggeratedly mm. short mm. time frame. But I wanted to m make the reader think about what world are we leaving to our, our yeah. next generations. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I almost think about my book as not an alternative imagination of the future, but an alternative imagination of the past. Mm -hmm. um, partly on an individual level, because so much of the book has to do with my process of growing up, mm -hmm. um, getting over my own nostalgia, um, but also kind of returning to our, our ancestors, the people who have come here before us and who figured out how to live in crisis. Um, this is not a new mm -hmm. thing. Um, the global scale of it is new, but um, people have been dealing with crises for thousands of years, and, and maybe it would be useful to think about, you know, ha has something like this happened before in mm -hmm. our collective past? Mm -hmm. How did we survive it before? Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. How might that help us survive in the future? Mm -hmm. yeah. Can you... I, yeah, I, working on the anthology just reified for me like how little we understand time. And I think that was so clear coming out of COVID, like time yeah. shifted, mm -hmm. like we 
people felt like they lost years or just like time just like bent, you know, like we, we don't understand, like temporality is a concept, then you have like daylight saving in America and it's like big, a big pushback to it actually from like black and indigenous communities and like what are you talking about, you can't just like cut out an hour of the sun, like, um, and I think it's so interesting what you were saying about different pasts because there are also parallel presents, there right. are versions of time that are operating now that are so different from like us understanding that this panel ends now in like 15 minutes mm -hmm. and so like <laughs> I'm just like allowing myself not to understand temporality and to try and like p p position like a, a presence around it I suppose mm. um, we don't know when the like you said the, yeah. the climate change is going to hit mm. like it's not necessarily going to be, be a moment that it hits you know mm. like it's just there's like all these layers of temporality happening all the time in different places in the world and mm. Yeah. You don't understand time at all, I don't, yeah. I don't think. Yeah, no, that's fascinating. <laughs> that's beautiful. Uh, before I... Oh, okay, please. Yeah. Uh, hi. hi. Um, I'm thinking of something you said, Keely, about um, this, the collective in your book. And um, I'm thinking about what Amitabh Ghosh says about, you know, realist literature um, being to set in, uh, in, in the story of the individual mm -hmm. and how, you know, solving environmental problems, specifically climate change, is something that, you know, requires us to think in the collective. Mm -hmm. and, and, like, in what other ways does speculative fiction um, and dystopian stories enable us to think in collective ways. Um, yeah, that, that's mm -hmm. some form of the question that I'm looking to unearth. Thank yeah, you. That's a great, that's a great question. Um, I definitely think that th what will keep us yeah, when I imagine the future, what is hopeful is uh, knowing that we are communal creatures and um, there are ways of thinking and knowing that, that embrace collectivity, which have been kind of marginalized by, by capitalist, individualist, Protestant thinking, um, but that certainly haven't been expunged from our collective history. And I see more of an interest in collective thinking, communal thinking, which is very hopeful. One of my favorite quotes is Binya Vanga Waneda once said that in the, world in the year 2050, all the world will live in the politics of Audre Lorde and James Baldwin, and we will carry everybody in their love. And when I imagine the most hopeful future possible, that's what I imagine. <laughs> Alice, do you want to come in on this question? Um, I, uh, I, I don't know what I could contribute, sorry. I, I no, think that's no, a beautiful too. idea. I, yeah. I hope that we manage to find our way back to each other. I think, as you say, I think the capitalist model has damaged that capacity quite, quite deeply in, in all of us, but it is really encouraging to see more collective models coming to the fore. Even in the environmental movement now, there's more indigenous groupings, there's more anti-capitalist groupings. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, quickly, I just I also loved what you said earlier in response to that about the resisting the urge to create heroes mm -hmm. because much like in the world, like the storytelling tradition of the hero's journey is such a definitive storytelling tradition that is not very like useful. Like heroes aren't great, you know. Like we've learned mm -hmm. about that in this country. Like you know, statues and monumentizing certain human beings is just a recipe for disaster. So I'm glad you didn't make heroes and like you know, like realizing that that's so so part of our conditioning to think about like how we make change or how we do this, like one person is a protagonist that like holds the world on their shoulders, like it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. So, you know, collectivism or collective care and mm -hmm. rethinking yeah. the hero's journey as like a collective mm -hmm. journey, not towards like one end, mm -hmm. um, is, is a cool way of like restructuring the, the ways we think about story also and then mm -hmm. the ways we embody story, I guess. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks, that's a wonderful contribution. Um, We've got a few minutes left, so I can squeeze in one more question if there is one. Ah, great. Thank you. Hi. Thank you so much for your time. And though I was a bit late, I'm sorry about that. But uh, I just wanted to find out is how can you 
as a writer, write stories that are shocking maybe about the future, and yet you want to make maybe a five-year-old or a two-year-old be aware of that? How could you maybe relate to a child's perspective when you're writing? Can you just maybe elaborate on that if you can? Okay. Anyone, how do you... <laughs> Sorry, I, I, I think I missed the question. Was it about how do you write a child's Yeah, how do you write from a child's perspective when you're writing about the future? Uh, so, so for me, I, like I said, my book starts and ends in a child's perspective. Yes. And I wanted to do that so that we think about how our actions impact the next generation. I also think there's something really freeing about writing from a child's perspective because it almost gives you a sense of lost innocence and you can look at the world with fresh mm. eyes and it makes you question things that maybe as an adult you don't question in the same way. Uh, so mm. it was almost tapping into a, a, a space in my own psyche which is less sure of anything. Mm. Mm. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Sheila, do you want to come in? Um, yeah, I, th I think that my book personally is a lot about growing up um, so certainly not directed at like a young child, but uh, it was written for the child in me um, to try to encourage her to, to grow up and take responsibility for herself. Um, not something that I think children need to be rushed into, but mm. I would appreciate um, more, yeah, the next generation being raised with the sense of at the end of the day, we must take responsibility for mm. ourselves, our pasts, uh, our family's pasts, and then also take responsibility for each other. Mm. Thanks. Um, mm. So uh, as a concluding word and as a way of thanking the audience for attending and thanking our contributors for um, putting in the work to create these incredible things that are now in the world. Um, just, uh, I guess for me, a concluding reflection, what I've, what, I've, what I've gained from engaging with your work is that um, things are bleak. I mean, things aren't great. Um, <laughs> yes. Um, but there, there are possibilities of, of being a lot more intentional about how we inhabit you know, the complexity, the, 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 the density of the pain. And I think that for me, that was something really striking across the three bodies of work. Um, and part of this, that inhabitation is to build a facility to both acknowledge that pain, to be able to work through it, yeah. but at the same time to understand that that's not a singular act, mm -hmm. right? And so there's this, you know, in, 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 in Alistair's book, this movement between sort of the classic individual model of therapy, but also a recognition that that in and of itself actually is, it's, it's a relational thing mm -hmm. by, by and of itself. And I think that's come through really powerfully both in the work, but also in the conversation mm -hmm. today. And in some ways there's something really liberating about knowing that there are alternative ways of inhabiting really sort of bleak or narrowed in futures. Mm -hmm. Um, and that by that kind of inhabitation, you are contributing to a different kind of future, mm -hmm. right? And mm -hmm. so there's, mm -hmm. there's something quite beautiful about that. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much. Thank I you, Edgar. learned an incredible amount, um, <laughs> felt an enormous amount, um, and that was really wonderful. And thank you to the audience thank you. for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.